Hello and welcome to this download from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is Margaret Macmillan. Margaret is a Canadian historian based in Oxford. Her previous books include Peacemakers, a history of the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, for which she won the Samuel Johnson Prize, and Seize the Hour, an account of Richard Nixon's landmark visit to China in 1972. Her new book is called The Uses and Abuses of History, and is a timely warning that politicians who invoke historical precedent to justify their actions are treading on dangerous ground. More than that, it's a clear-sighted, level-headed look at what we should and should not expect from history. I asked her what prompted her to write the book. I think there were a number of things, probably. I think partly to do with my age. I think it hits you when you get to a certain age. I'm now in my 60s. Um, that you start to wonder about what it is you've been doing all your life. And I've been doing history all my life. And so you start to think about why you do it and what it means. And I suppose that was one of the reasons. Another reason, I think, was I'd been doing quite a lot on nationalism. And it struck me how important a role historians in the 19th century and the 20th century played in the development of nationalism, how they helped to create national myths and national identities. And the third thing that happened was as a result of the Allied, um, or the, the Allied invasion and occupation of Iraq, when people like Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, um, President Bush himself kept on saying history teaches us that we must do this. And so I thought maybe I could take all these disparate ideas and, and talk about the ways in which history is used and, I, and abused. And I, I really wanted to do this not so much for historians but for the general public because it seems to me that history is used in, in public in very interesting ways. And I think I was become, beginning to become sort of more, more aware of this. Mm. Now, you, you talk early on in the book about the comforts of history, and for us in the affluent North, it sometimes seems as though history is simply a sub-branch of the leisure and entertainment industry, and I guess you would see that as a clear abuse of, of history's potential. Well, I'd never mind people being interested in history. I mean, it's a bit like historical novels and, and historical films. I mean, they may not always be good history, but if it creates a sense of awareness that there were other worlds there and alternative sorts of worlds to our own, then I think that is a good thing. But I do think there's a, there's a nostalgia for the past. It has become a form of entertainment. Um, you look at the success, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing in many ways of the National Trust, but it is promoting a view of the past. I mean, if you go to Williamsburg in the United States, which was a, a white colony based on slave owning, you don't see any blacks there, or used not to see any blacks there. And then that, I find, is it can be, can be a bit problematic. I think we also look to the past because our own world is rather confusing and disturbing at the moment, and perhaps likely to become even more so. And so we look to the past because things seem simpler then. I mean, I think that's part of the nostalgia for World War II. Mm. It was a good war. We we were good. It was all clear. It was clear who was good and bad. Of course, it wasn't that clear always. And sometimes good people did bad things. Um, I, I think um, that that you know that the, there were things we did during the Second World War and on the Allied side, like the mass bombing of Germany, which probably weren't um, all that clear cut. But I think we look at the past because it's comfortable. Um, it seems to us comfortable. It's there. It's done. We can see nice stories in it. And again, as an historian, I'm not sure that's the right way to be looking at the past. You said you, you weren't writing the book principally for your professional peers, but the book is, in a sense, a sort of shot across their bows or a, a, a wake-up call, if yeah. you like, that they, they need to be a bit more um, engaged, perhaps. Yeah. Well, I think so, because there seems to be two things have happened in the profession. One is that we've become very interested in theory, which I think we need to be. Perhaps historians have not dealt enough with theory. But I think we've become rather too much interested in how we ourselves create the past, which is fine and an interesting subject, but I think we also need to be looking at the past itself and trying to figure out um, the way in which things actually happened in the past. I think the other thing that's happened is I think there's been a slightly um, snooty attitude um, in our profession that what we're doing is so important and we're so professional that we can't really talk to the general public and we shouldn't be trying to talk to the general public. And I think the danger in that is that if we don't talk to the general public, other people will fill the gap because there is this interest in history. And so in the United States, for example, you get a lot of journalists writing history, which they do quite well, but they're not trained historians. And so I think, there's, there's a, uh, they, I think there are certain deficiencies in the way in which they write it. Is it going too far to say that you think there's a moral responsibility upon historians, professional trained historians, to communicate the subtleties and complexities of history with the general public? Yeah, I always hate saying moral responsibility because it sounds rather priggish, mm. but mm. I do think, I mean, we're, we're, those of us in universities are paid for by the public, we are supported by the public, and I think we have an obligation to explain what we're doing to the public, and I think when necessary, get involved in public debates. I mean, I think historians do sometimes have things to say that are very useful on the great issues of the time. You, you talked about public perception of, of history, and obviously a lot of that is formed while we're children. 
do you think the battle's kind of almost lost or won by the time a child leaves school because they, they have had a particular view of history inculcated within them that they'll probably carry, maybe modify, but carry through the rest of their lives, which may be about battles and national superiority or, or maybe today different, you know, different views about slavery or whatever. But do you, think, do you think that's the sort of key battleground to get people to, to form some kind of view of history that um, will be valuable to them in later life? I hope it's not the key battleground because I like to think of history as something that you keep doing all your life and you keep learning all your life and you keep changing your views and I, I think it would be very sad if we all made up our minds by the time we're 18 that that's what we think about the world and that's that. But I do agree with you that people often have very formative encounters with history when they're quite young. Where I think it can be, be bad is if it turns them off. I mean, I've had a great many students who said I've always hated history because it was all about dates and I think that is, is very unfortunate. I think also a view of history that, you know, we the British were always right, that those French across the channel were always wrong is, is not good. But perhaps having no history at all is even worse. Um, that's all I can, you know, that's, that, that's, that's the only defense I can make of the sort of rather simple-minded history. But if you can get people interested in history, then it's not something that should suddenly stop. It mm. should be something that goes on and on. Here we are sitting, talking in Oxford in a very civilised fashion, but your book is very clear-sighted about the fact that there are many situations around the world in which history is fiercely contested and brings in all sorts of issues of national identity. And one sentence that, that stuck out for me was, you were, you were writing about Serbian ultranationalism, you say, it's easy to challenge such views of the past, but not to shake the faith of those who wish to believe in them. And I wondered if that meant that history can, all, you know, can follow the politics on the ground, if you like, but it can't, it can't actually get purchase on the belief systems in people's heads. I think it is very hard to challenge such belief systems. I, I mean, I don't mean you shouldn't try it. I think you should, actually. And there was an attempt made, certainly in, in Yugoslavia, before it fell to pieces, to challenge some of the myths of the past. And I thought a very healthy attempt, because at least people were talking about it openly. But it is hard, because your past is, especially in, in places, I think, that have had very troubled pasts, the past is so tied up with your identity. And so if you challenge the myths, I mean, in fact, it can be personally very dangerous. But that doesn't, I, I, think that, I think the effort should be made, because I think these myths can be poisonous and very dangerous. I mean, the whole myth that Serbian ultranationalists had of Serbs always fighting on the front lines of Christianity against um, the Muslim hordes, which is false, but was a very powerful myth and, and helped to lead them to commit atrocities in Bosnia. Mm.